Welcome once again. Right now we're at Hebrews chapter 9, talking about the sacrifice of Christ. Now indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared. In the first part were the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the holy place. After the second veil was the tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies, having an altar of golden incense and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which was a golden pot holding the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it, cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, of which things we can't speak now in detail. Little interesting side note here, the altar of golden incense, or incense in and of itself, represents the prayers of the saints. Now these things, having been thus prepared, the priests go in continually into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the services. But into the second, the high priest alone, once in the year, not without blood, which he offers for himself and for the errors of the people. Kind of strange here that it says errors here in this translation. It's more accurately translated as sins. The Holy Spirit is indicating this, that the way into the holy place wasn't yet revealed while the first tabernacle was still standing. This is a symbol of the present age, where gifts and sacrifices are offered that are incapable, concerning the conscience, of making the worshiper perfect, being only, with foods and drinks and various washings, fleshly ordinances imposed until a time of reformation. But Christ, having come as a high priest of the coming good things, through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, nor yet through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood entered in once for all into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. The purpose and function of animal sacrifices was to provide a catalyst for repentance. The whole idea is when you have a sin in your life, you're struggling with a sin, and you just have a hard time overcoming this sin. You are to take your animal sacrifice to the priest and watch the priest slay that animal. And as you watch that priest slay the animal, you are to connect spiritually with that animal. It's like a prophetic outward expression of what's going on on the inside. As that animal dies, you are to connect with that and say, my sin dies with it. That's why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Because you see, Christ is as the animal sacrifice. We are to look upon him, not as someone who took our place or paid some kind of a debt, but rather someone that we can connect to and say that we've died with him. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 6, how can you who are dead to sin live in it any longer? Also in Colossians, Paul made that very clear as well. You who died to sin through the body of Christ. Okay, that is the whole idea of animal sacrifices. It wasn't some kind of a magical covering for sins. If that was the case, why is it that time and time and time and time and time again, God rebuked people for having sin in their life even while and after they are uh, doing their animal sacrifices? In fact, God said that he doesn't even want those sacrifices. What he wants first and foremost is repentance from sin. God even said in other places that the sacrifices of the wicked are rejected. How does that 
jive with the whole theology that when you have sin, the, the sacrifice or the blood of that sacrifice covers your sin. No, that's not the idea. The idea is that sacrifice is supposed to provide a catalyst for you to repent of that sin. And when you do not make that connection, that is when God rejects your sacrifice. That is when God said, I've had enough of your sacrifices. Now think about how that applies today in Christianity. Because most Christians, okay, by far, most Christians say that their faith in the sacrifice of Jesus is based upon the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. So if that's the case, if Jesus is your sacrifice, if you claim Jesus as your sacrifice and you still go on sinning, then God would say, I reject that faith. That is serious. And that is what we're about to read in the next chapter, chapter 10. It's going to be awesome. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified to the cleanness of the flesh. In other words, cleaning your physical body. And by the way, do you know that the invention of soap came from ashes? You know, because ashes have in it a soap-like quality. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without defect to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, since a death has occurred for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, that those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a last will and testament is, there must of necessity be a death of him who made it. For a will is in force where there has been death. For it is never in force while he who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant has not been dedicated without blood. For when every commanded had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And that is found in Exodus chapter 24, verse 8. He sprinkled the tabernacle in all the vessels of the ministry in the same way with the blood. According to the law, nearly everything is cleansed with blood. And apart from shedding of blood, there is no remission. You see, the shedding of blood speaks of death. And repentance is death, figuratively speaking. So then, the shedding of blood speaks of repentance. It was necessary, therefore, that the copies of the things in the heavens should be cleansed with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ hasn't entered into holy places made with hands, which are representations of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the holy place year by year with blood not his own, or else he must have suffered often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has been revealed to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Put away sin, or as another translation would put it, to do away with sin. It's like John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not throws a rug over it, but takes it away. You see, we serve a God that is powerful enough to deliver people from sin, to break the chains of sin over someone's life so that they are not addicted to sin anymore. God is not weak to leave his people in sin. He has the power to set them free. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this, judgment. There's no room for reincarnation in biblical theology. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Or as another translation would put it, to bring salvation for those 
who are waiting for him. You see, some people, especially in the Jewish world, they, in their idea of Messiah is just that second part. They, you know, that he's to come and set up a kingdom and, you know, a political thing. But they have missed the first part, the power to do away with sin. And I must say it is the church's fault that people have missed this entire thing. In church, there should be strong preaching, identifying sin, pointing out sin, and preaching how to get free from sin, that God is not weak. God has the power to set you free from sin. And don't miss the next video because we are going to read Hebrews chapter 10, one of the most powerful chapters in the entire New Testament. Until next time, seek God with all your heart. And if you do, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.